The children entered the room. On the table, a red container full of what appeared to be Legos rested there. The children walked up to the container and, naturally, kids being kids, began to play with the Legos. The children were unaware that in an adjoining room, separated by a one-sided mirror, a team of 20 scientists analyzed their every movement as they played innocently with the Legos. The children started to pick up building blocks, piecing them together and making makeshift houses. One of the three total children picked up a humanoid figure and started to cry out in shock. That's when the children realized that these Lego pieces were animated. The Lego man in the child's hand waved at them, and when the child placed the figure back on the table, it began to walk around as if it were alive. The children clapped their hands and squealed with delight and continued to play with the living Lego. On the other side of the glass mirror, the scientists scrawled down on their notepads frantically. SCP-387 is currently stationed in a standard storage container in Site-19. Due to SCP-387 posing no danger to humans, it has been stored in a container with no special make. SCP-387 is a tub of commercially available Legos, seemingly ordinary to the naked eye. There are, however, a few irregular shapes in the box of Legos, including circular wheels and prisms. It has no brand name, and all companies that were interviewed by undercover agents denied ever making SCP-387. Of course, after these interviews, the individual's memories of SCP-387 were removed. An interesting feature of SCP-387 is that when the tub is not full, or when it is partially empty, the Lego blocks will duplicate themselves until the box is full. When all pieces were removed from the tub but one, it did not duplicate. However, when Lego blocks were returned until an even layer was made, SCP-387 continued to duplicate. If an excess amount of Lego blocks are placed on top of the tub to prevent from closing the lid, SCP-387 will shrink to make room. When other objects were placed in the tub, for example diamonds, it did not duplicate. When other Lego pieces from commercial brands were placed in the tub, they did not duplicate. It seems the tub is not what possesses duplicating properties, but SCP-387 must be in the tub in order to duplicate. SCP-387 will not duplicate in other random containers or spaces. Researchers guess this may be a ploy by the makers to avoid copyright of SCP-387. It is also interesting to see that when constructed by a human hand, SCP-387 will animate themselves. For example, a Lego man was placed inside a car. The Lego man proceeded to drive the car around, moving like a real person. The car toy was disassembled, and it is noted that it did not possess any complex machinery inside it. The cars also don't require fuel or any power source to move. The Lego people also have a form of sentience. They interact readily with each other, and when SCP-387 is left out on its own, the constructed buildings and people are quick to evolve. Lego men will take on police uniforms and roles when they find themselves alongside police cars. Lego people will use their own building blocks to construct skyscrapers and update infrastructure. They will expand their society through these means. SCP-387 does not seem to mind the presence of human interaction, but if a human turns hostile, SCP-387 will instantly lose sentience and become inanimate. An experiment was conducted in which a plane constructed from normal Lego pieces was placed in a chamber with SCP-387. After a few minutes, the Lego people of SCP-387 moved and began to build an airport using pieces of SCP-387. A petrol tank drove over to the plane, seemed to fill it with fuel, even though it had been noted that vehicles of SCP-387 do not require fuel and the plane proceeded to take off and fly through the air, zooming around the room. More planes were formed afterwards, each of different make and design. This all took place within three hours. SCP-387 thus seems able to interact and evolve with normal Lego pieces. Judging by this, I'd say that constructions of SCP-387 have some form of understanding of the surrounding environment, and they are able to convert existing Lego to 387, says head scientist Dr. Arch. SCP-387 was first found in February of 2004 by an agent of the SCP Foundation. The agent was returning home on a long train ride. He reported going to his seat, which was empty. He went to the bathroom and returned to find SCP-387 resting in the seat next to him. The lid was open and he reached in and constructed a Lego man. As soon as he completed the construction, miraculously the Lego man moved and walked around. The agent immediately disassembled the Lego man and brought SCP-387 straight to the SCP Foundation site. Security tapes from the train were quickly destroyed to avoid public knowledge. Dr. Arch advises that SCP-387 should not be given to children under the age of 10, 
especially if the aforementioned children are influenced by cartoons and television shows. This is due to an experiment conducted in March of 2015 in which two kids, ages 5 and 8, were placed into the room with SCP-387. The children were given instructions to let their imaginations run wild, and the children proceeded to play with SCP-387. Once the kids realized the objects were animate, they were immediately excited and agreed to create warriors to fight in battles. These included a Transformers character as well as an M1 Abrams tank. Once these objects were constructed, the kids were immediately removed from the room. At this point, the Transformer and M1 Abrams tank attacked each other, destroying each other in the process. It has been noted that these objects will not fire or attack when in the presence of humans. It appears SCP-387's relation to humans is positive. In another experiment, a robot arm was used to construct a car. The car did not animate. When a human hand constructed the car, it moved around. When the dead hand of a deceased agent was used to construct a car, it did not animate. When the dead hand was heated up and used to construct a car, the car still did not animate. Dr. Arch has concluded that SCP-387 seems to respond only to a pulse or some sign of human life. He also recommended that staff be allowed to play with SCP-387, as it has been reported that once an individual has played with SCP-387, morale and attitude have boosted by 87%. Staff members were thus allowed free time to interact with SCP-387, but of course with supervision. However, this permission was revoked after Incident 34AB2. Two staff members entered the room for their period with SCP-387. Unknown to head scientists, one of the staff members had brought in her Mega Blocks, a common copy of LEGO. The two staff members proceeded to build a small community with SCP-387, and they left the room, leaving the Mega Block figures with SCP-387. Security camera footage shows what occurred after all humans left the room. Slowly, together as one, the figures of SCP-387 turned to the Mega Block characters, and then they attacked. SCP-387 LEGO people charged at the Mega Block characters, wielding swords and spears like an army of soldiers. Enhancement of security footage shows that a leader of sorts was commanding the army to attack the Mega Block pieces. Within a few minutes, the Mega Block pieces were reduced to debris, and SCP-387 continued as usual. The Mega Block characters did not defend themselves, of course, since they were inanimate. But that did not stop SCP-387. Once the Mega Block characters were defeated, SCP-387's community collected the debris and tossed it over the side of the table to fall to the floor. When the two staff members returned from work to play with SCP-387 and the Mega Block characters once again, they were surprised to find their Mega Block pieces were missing. SCP-387 did not behave differently after the incident, acting as if nothing had happened. If it weren't for the security camera footage, scientists would be unaware of the unusual ordeal that took place regarding the Mega Block pieces. As to the reason behind SCP-387's unorthodox behavior, Dr. Arch predicts that it may have something to do with SCP-387 being jealous of the Mega Block pieces. It is clear that SCP-387 possesses a good relationship with humans, and thus they may become jealous of any other Lego-like character that could pose a threat to their good relationship with humans. Nonetheless, free time with SCP-387 has been limited to personnel, and only a select few with hard supervision are allowed to interact with SCP-387. SCP-387's strange duplication capabilities have also caused a number of theories to be developed amongst staff members. Many theories that SCP-387 actually steals these extra pieces of LEGO from other LEGO sets across the globe, and that is why children always seem to be losing LEGO pieces in their sets. Some believe that these LEGO pieces have been pulled from alternate universes, while others suggest SCP-387 is capable of altering the air and transforming mere nitrogen into carbon. These theories, however, are not soundproof, and their lack of evidence indicates that these theories should only be taken lightly. Thanks for watching. Did you enjoy learning about SCP-387? What would you build if you had SCP-387 all to yourself? Comment below. Please also make sure you like and subscribe and hit that notification bell. You don't want to miss out on any of these awesome SCP cases. The farmer went around the farm doing his usual odd jobs. He swept up the barn, checked on the chickens, then went out to the field to round up the cattle. But as he entered the field, his jaw dropped. There, sitting silently in the middle of his field, was a plane. The farmer scratched his head in confusion as he stared at the massive plane. Yesterday, it hadn't been there, 
Had someone landed here just now? But why here? And why in this field? He decided to investigate things further and walked over to the plane. The staircase was open, so he climbed up into the plane. He noticed the side of the plane appeared to have just been painted over. He found this unusual, as why would someone paint a plane in his field? This was private property. It was dark and ominous inside the plane. He stepped in and looked around. Then he screamed. In each seat was a passenger, and all of them were, were dead. dead. Welcome back to SCP Exposed. Today we bring you a safe class object, SCP-787. The plane is a Boeing 747-200 airliner of unknown manufacturing date and source. The exterior of the plane has been painted over, including all passenger windows. The paint was wet upon recovery, drying soon after. The mechanical components of the plane are all undamaged and functional and show no signs of use. Non-mechanical components of SCP-787, including carpeting, upholstery, and luggage, are in an advanced state of decay. The pilot and co-pilot seats have been removed, replaced with two piles of computer components arranged in the shape of chairs. SCP-787 was initially discovered in a field near Bremerton, Washington in June 1987. Investigations into the surrounding area confirmed no eyewitness accounts of the plane having landed there or of the plane being transported to the field. The plane is currently contained within Hangar 4 on Foundation Site 53. Security cameras and sound recording equipment are to be stationed in the cockpit, passenger area, and baggage hold of SCP-787 to record any anomalous events. In the event of any anomalous activity within the plane, access to the interior of the plane is to be prohibited for a minimum of 72 hours. SCP-787 contains the bodies of 515 deceased individuals. The cause of death varies among specimens, with causes including strangulation, loss of blood, drowning, starvation, bullet wounds, stab wounds, and blunt force trauma. Despite these different causes of death, the specimens have been found with similar forms of mutilations, including removal of the tongue, 23 instances, scalping, 73 instances, carving of Cyrillic letters into the left palm, 230 instances, with no pattern found, and removal of fingertips, 498 instances. All specimens are in advanced stages of decay, but have shown no signs of decaying further. They appear almost frozen in state. Visual apparitions, or unexplained noises, will spontaneously manifest within SCP-787. These incidents have not occurred when the plane is occupied by Foundation personnel. Attempts to enter the plane after these events will result in individuals being violently forced away from the plane by some unknown presence, accompanied by severe organ damage and internal bleeding. The period this secondary effect remains varies, but has not lasted longer than 72 hours. The following is a list of anomalous events that have taken place inside SCP-787. August 1st, 1988. The sound of pounding against doors and windows on the left side of the plane could be heard, lasting 7 minutes and 15 seconds. Interior cameras picked up no movement during this period. February 22nd, 1997. A male voice was heard in the forward men's wash closet, repeating the phrase, Philosophers always run from the advanced thickening treatment five times. October 6, 2003, the in-flight movie activated, displaying a repeating series of seven black and white still images of a deceased male human, accompanied by a female voice reading a vacuum cleaner manual in check. This lasted for 43 minutes. December 27, 2009, the fastened seatbelt sign flickered on and off for three hours and 41 minutes, accompanied by a repeated loop of the first 15 seconds of White Rabbit by Jefferson Airplane played over the speaker system. This is the longest recorded anomalous event within SCP-787. July 30th, 2011. An indistinct humanoid figure manifested in the aisle next to CH-43 and removed the emergency air supply. The figure placed the breathing mask on and stood still for 2 minutes and 15 seconds before removing the mask and walking out of frame. Figure did not appear on any other cameras. January 15, 2013. A manifestation of an indistinct humanoid figure, approximately 1 meter in height, occurred. The figure sat in the co-pilot's chair for 3 minutes and 50 seconds, making soft whimpering noises before vomiting onto the control console and exiting the cockpit. Examination of the vomit revealed traces of nitrous oxide, thorium, bird droppings, and three human fingernails. 
May 5th, 2015. A female voice was heard throughout the plane saying, For your comfort and enjoyment today, pancakes will now be served. Please do not leave your seat. Pancakes will now be served. Please do not leave your seat. Do not leave your seat. Leave your seat. Please, pancakes will now be served. Yay, pancakes. September 8th, 2018. The emergency air supplies deployed and retracted repeatedly for 14 minutes, 15 seconds, accompanied by screaming from a group of 10 to 20 people. Pitch of screaming shifted depending on the position of breathing masks. November 29th, 2019. The internal temperature in the plane shifted from 20 degrees Celsius to 13 degrees Celsius over the space of 19 seconds, remaining at this temperature for 10 minutes and 29 seconds before resuming the average temperature. Several of the passengers on the flight have been identified. However, many of them possess unusual cases, such as SCP-787-A-112, a retired optometrist whose wife and children confirmed he had never boarded a plane in his life. He is currently living in Atlanta, Georgia. Subject was interviewed by Foundation agents on December 14th and was found to have no knowledge or memory of any anomalous incidents taking place. The same case applied for SCP-787-A-99. She was an old school teacher. Her family recalled her going missing one day with no explanation or warning. She lived in Atlanta with a husband and three children. She even showed an aversion to flying at the time. Only around 47% of the individuals on board the flight have been identified, however. This is mainly due to mutilations of fingerprints and disfigured faces. However, the foundation is currently working to identify more of the passengers. Of course, the families of those deceased have been given false stories as to why their loved ones went missing and passed away, to avoid questioning from the public. Another unusual discovery of the deceased individuals within SCP-787 is the fact that some appear to have existed from different time periods. One individual was found with a pocket watch that was only produced in 1949 and was discontinued in the same year. Others were found with outdated attire, and one man even had a newspaper in his coat pocket dated 1924. This time period does not align with the invention of the Boeing airplane, and thus, Foundation personnel question whether these objects were placed to throw off the Foundation, or whether these individuals really were from the past. How they ended up inside the plane, however, is still unknown. In February of 2008, an examination of SCP-787's waste storage tank revealed an additional deceased individual, an Indian male approximately 30 years of age. Subject was in possession of the following. A three-piece tailored suit, a surgical mask and rubber gloves, an unloaded Beretta DT-10 shotgun, one box of Tic Tac brand mints containing 14 cinnamon flavor mints, a switchblade, an Eye of Horus amulet constructed of recycled aluminum and twine, the plane's flight log, the coordinates negative 27.41, negative 122.70 were logged 5,478 times. A movie ticket for Return of the Jedi, the number 92 is written on the back in permanent marker. The deceased man did not display a similar state of decay as the rest of SCP-787 specimens. His cause of death is unknown. Foundation personnel wonder whether he is the overseer of the plane's manifestation, but this does not explain why he is dead or how the plane appeared in the field in the first place. O5 personnel have encouraged Foundation members to offer any theories as to how SCP-787 appeared. So far, only a few stand as possible origin stories. The plane is actually an extreme decoy to hiding murder victims. It is a dimensional anomaly, perhaps of parallel universe sources, which could explain the different time periods of the passengers and the anomalous events such as people speaking and shouting. It is of extraterrestrial origin. However, there is a lack of evidence to back up this theory. What did you think of that SCP case? Do you have any of your own theories as to how and why SCP-787 came into existence? Comment your thoughts below and be sure to subscribe to our channel so we can keep making SCP videos for you to enjoy. It was a cold September morning in one of the most remote provinces in China. It had been an unusual summer season for the villagers. They were used to seeing many visitors during the summer months, and this year was no exception. People came from far and wide to trek through the forest adjoining the village. The forest was popular because of its abundance of rare flora and fauna, but this year not everyone who entered the forest came out. There had been stories all summer of families reporting their relatives going missing. 
The local police force had sent out search parties, but none of the missing persons were ever found. It was as if they had vanished into thin air. The villagers had their own theories about what had happened. Some people speculated that a mystical wolf was living in the forest and devouring them. Others were suspicious that it was actually the families that were to blame. That, in fact, perhaps the families had killed their relatives and buried them in the forest. Nobody knew for sure what had happened as no bodies were ever found. The leader of the village knew that if the disappearances continued, then tourists would stop coming to visit the forest. He couldn't afford to let that happen. The local people relied on the money the tourists brought into the village. They wouldn't survive if no one came. He decided that he would take matters into his own hands. He would search the forest himself to find any clues. He wasn't concerned about entering the forest alone. He knew it like the back of his hand. He had spent most of his childhood playing in the depths of the forest and he never got lost. He took the track that led to the very center. As he walked deeper and deeper into the forest, the trees got denser and it got darker and darker. Only a small chink of light could make its way through the denseness. Suddenly, he looked around him. It had only been about three months since he had last visited the forest, but things looked very different. There were a number of strange sphere-shaped objects just over a meter tall dotted between the trees. He wondered what their purpose was. He approached the largest of the spheres. He could see that it was a hive-like structure with many chambers. He was just about to put his hand inside one of the chambers to find out what it was concealing when he felt something crawling across his cheek towards his mouth. He reached up and grabbed hold of the insect, but at that moment, he felt a sharp pain on his finger and he dropped the creature onto the floor. When he saw what it was, he relaxed. It was just a common garden earwig, nothing to be worried about. It must have given him a pinch with its abdominal forceps. But what the man didn't realize was that this was no common earwig. Welcome back to SCP Exposed. Before I go on, please make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any creepy SCP stories. Today, we bring you Euclid Class Object SCP-439. SCP-439 is a small insect approximately 2.5 centimeters in length. It has a translucent grayish color and is very similar to the Forficula auricularia, otherwise known as the common earwig. The origins of this insect are currently unknown. The foundation has only ever come across one specimen that was found in the middle of a dense forest in a remote province in mainland China. This creature is relatively harmless to human beings. Its huge abdominal forceps are capable of giving a painful pinch, but unless provoked, it is unlikely to attack. Its only danger to human life is in the way that it forms the habitat that it needs in order to be able to reproduce. First, the creature enters the human body through the mouth. In order to enter, the human being must be asleep. It is currently unknown how the creature determines that the human has fallen asleep. But what we do know is that the creature is accurate in knowing that the human is asleep in the majority of cases. Once the creature has located a suitable host, it waits in a dark corner of the room for the human to go to sleep. Once asleep, the creature approaches the human and enters the body through the mouth. SCP-439 travels along the trachea and takes up residence in one of the lungs. This occupancy of the body only occurs in humans. Other life forms have been offered to SCP-439 but have been rejected. Within less than eight hours of the human awakening, the first symptoms will appear. Chest pains, difficulty in breathing are the first signs, closely followed by severe abdominal cramping. The tightness in the chest will become more severe and the host will break out in a fever. This will leave the host incapacitated. At this time is when the beginnings of Fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, FOP, occur. FOP is normally a genetic disease that causes muscle tissue to turn into bone. The development of the new bone is so rapid, it causes severe pain in the human. Often, new bone spurs can be seen protruding from the skin. During this process, the human will seek out a dark, enclosed space to take refuge. Commonly, this is inside cabinets or heating ducts. If the host receives no treatment at all, it will only take within three days for him to reach the final stage of the transformation into what is known as the bone hive. When the host reaches this point, he will take up the fetal position. Sections of the skeletal structure will shift position until the body takes on a sphere-like shape. New bones will continue to form to produce a cage to protect the internal organs and colony. The end result will be around three-fourths of the size of the original human body. At this point, transformation is complete. 
The original queen that entered the host will have produced 20 to 30,000 offspring that function as workers, drones, and warriors in a typical insect hive hierarchy. Since only the queen is capable of reproduction, the rest of the hive's inhabitants are fortunately harmless except for the large, strong abdominal forceps of the warriors. The interior of the sphere is now almost unrecognizable from its original form. Some of the internal organs are used as food, whilst others are modified by the worker insects to be used as egg incubation chambers. The warrior insects collect organic material which is then processed by the host's digestive system into a nutritive slurry which feeds the colony and also maintains the hive structure. It takes around four to six months for a new queen to emerge. She will select a drone to mate with. Once this has happened, the colony will destroy itself by rupturing the sphere. The majority of the insects will die at this time as drones and workers cannot survive outside of the colony. Now that their task has been completed, the warrior insects will abandon the sphere. No food will be consumed by warriors that aren't nutritive slurry produced by the hive of origin. The new queen will venture out, fertilized, to search for her own new hive. Incredibly, the trauma of evacuation is not what finally causes biological activity to cease in the hive, but starvation is the cause. A particular disturbing piece of information was discovered when one of the leading female doctors in this field performed a range of experiments to see what damage had occurred to the body during the transformation. Previous autopsies had shown that some parts of the brain had been destroyed to be used for food, whilst other parts remained intact, presumably to control the bodily functions that were still required by the colony. During the doctor's study, she had the opportunity to examine a host structure shortly after its transformation. Although we know that the eyes are eventually used for food, because this particular structure had been found straight after its transformation, the eyes were still intact. The doctor lifted the eyelids and shone a beam of light into the eyes. The eyes moved and followed the beam as it went from left to right. At this point, the experiment was terminated and there are no plans for any further testing. SCP-439 is currently being kept at the hazardous life forms wing of Armed Research Site 45. The creature is kept in a sealed and locked 38-liter Type-G containment unit. The unit is connected to an oxygen supply and the creature is being fed through feeding tube 16A. The creature's diet consists solely of the approved nutritive substance XF. Handling is authorized only to personnel level 2 and higher. The Foundation's personnel have many theories as to why this creature exists. Some personnel feel that the insect's purpose is to take over the world whilst others feel that it only seeks to prevent its own demise. Whatever the case, SCP-439 must be handled with great care. What do you think of that SCP case? Very disturbing, isn't it? Please comment below with your thoughts. It had been a tough day at school for Jake and he couldn't wait for the bell to ring to signal the end of the day. He watched the clock on the wall. It seemed like an eternity before the hands reached three o'clock. The alarm sounded. He picked up his bag and ran down the corridor and out of the school gates. All he wanted to do was to get home and play his favorite game, Among Us. He hoped that his parents weren't home yet because they didn't like him spending too much time in front of his computer, so they would probably make him wait until after dinner to play. He would just stepped through the front door to his house when he heard his mom call out, Jake, is that you? Jake sighed and went through to the kitchen where his mom was preparing dinner. Come and help with these vegetables, she said. Oh, mom, I want to play on my computer. You know the rules. Wait until after dinner. Jake knew there was no point in arguing with his mom. She would never change her mind. As soon as dinner was finished, Jake ran up to his room and switched on his computer. He waited impatiently for the screen to light up. He opened up the app and joined a new lobby. There were only four players so far, so Jake sat back and waited for others to join. Come on, hurry up. Another player joined. His name was Phthonus. As they waited for other players to join, Phthonus started talking in the chat function. He was ranting on and on about the president of Greece. Jake rolled his eyes. Don't know why this dude is so riled up about the president, Jake thought. Eventually, they had 10 players and the game began. Jake saw that he was a crewmate. Now he had to work out who the imposter was. He looked to see what tasks he had to perform. What? Only two tasks? This is going to be easy. Jake pulled the trash chute lever and watched as the trash went down. Now I've just got the wires to connect. 
He took the red wire and put it into the red socket. Then he did the same with the blue. As he did, he noticed on the left of the screen that one player had left the game. That's weird, I wonder why he's gone. Jake carried on, but then another two players left the game. He wondered what was going on, but then other players left until there was only Jake and Phthonus left. The game automatically finished then and Phthonus had won. He was the imposter. Jake was disappointed with the game and he didn't want to play anymore. He went to switch off the computer, but it wouldn't switch off. Jake wondered what was going on and was starting to feel a bit scared. He decided he would go downstairs and spend the rest of the evening with his parents. But when he walked into the lounge, he suddenly started freaking out. Who are you? You're not my mom and dad. You're someone else pretending to be them. Jake, what's wrong with you? Of course we're your parents. No, no, you're, you're not. Tell me where they are. What have you done with them? Jake started frantically pacing around the room, holding his hands over his ears. He didn't know what was going on, but he knew one thing for sure. These people had done something with his parents and were probably going to hurt him too. If you don't tell me where my parents are, I'm calling the police. I think we'd better call the doctor. I think you must be overtired. That's why you're acting so paranoid. Jake's mom called the hospital and told them how Jake was acting. When she put the phone down, she turned to Jake. They're going to send a doctor out to see you. All Jake wanted to do was get out of the house, but his parents persuaded him to stay and at least let the doctor examine him. About 10 minutes later, there was a knock at the door. That must be the doctor, said Jake's mom. But when she opened the door, Jake saw two men in suits standing there. We need you to come with us, they said. Welcome back to SCP Exposed. Today we bring you the Keter class subject, SCP-5167. Before I go on, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any more SCP stories. SCP-5167 is an entity known to manifest as a player of the online multiplayer game Among Us, under the username Phthonus. It will randomly join multiplayer lobbies of the game and participate as an ordinary player would with the majority of its anomalous effects only becoming obvious following the initial encounter. During this initial encounter, it has been observed to communicate using the in-game chat function. Among the majority of its speech consists of lengthy diatribes produced at little prompting from other players. Individuals who interact with SCP-5167 in-game will subsequently begin to exhibit symptoms of paranoia and cap-cross delusion. This is a psychiatric disorder in which an individual comes to believe that those around them have been replaced with identical imposters. The severity of these symptoms varies from person to person, but in initial cases was significant enough to prompt acts of perceived self-defense from those affected. These symptoms persist for a period initially believed to encompass several months, but has lessened to one or two weeks as observation has continued. SCP-5167 was initially discovered by the Foundation after a period during which the player Phthonus was a minor urban legend in the Among Us community. Although interest in the figure died down fairly quickly, Foundation web crawlers flagged recorded accounts of players' encounters with the entity as potential anomalous phenomena. Learning computer PSI-2, known as Meville, was assigned to track sessions of the game until SCP-5167 was encountered. When the other players in said session were tracked down, they exhibited the symptoms now associated with SCP-5167. Foundation efforts to track the individual behind SCP-5167 have thus far proven unsuccessful. All attempts to locate the internet access point used by the anomaly have led to deserted home addresses in rural Greece. Foundation web crawlers are to monitor online communities for mentions of potential SCP-5167 sightings. In cases where these sightings are confirmed, all direct witnesses are to be apprehended and all secondary evidence removed from the platform in question. Apprehended witnesses are to be held until symptoms of SCP-5167 abate and are then to be amnestized and released under a standard mental breakdown cover story. Michael Ross, the intelligence director of Site-22, gave the following report on SCP-5167. As requested by head researcher Abrams, I've had the Site-22 analyst look into the progress of SCP-5167's anomalous effects over the period we've observed it, and the results are much as I expected. When we first discovered it, for the sake of argument, let's say this is when SCP-5167 first came into existence, the impact it had on its victims was severe. 
I don't think I have to remind you of what Billy Hath did to his family's faces. But since then, almost immediately really, since that first couple of manifestations, the potency of its effects has started to decline. Full detachment from reality became delusion, and delusion has now become paranoia. Also, the intensity of that paranoia is lessening in each case. This is all conjecture, of course, and shouldn't be taken as gospel. But based on what we've observed of this anomaly thus far, our estimation is that SCP-5167's anomalous effects will become inert by the end of the year. Whether it'll keep popping up in these video game matches is another story. The following is a log of SCP-5167 as observed by Learning Computer PSI-2 in a game of Among Us. SCP-5167 participated in the game without communicating until specifically addressed by other players. Red, where were you when the reactor was called? John Arbuckle said. Where was I? I was there when the mountains were newborn and the oceans virginal. I was there when gods walked among men and their wisdom was cast down like sunlight. I was there when mankind was capable of legends, said SCP-5167. And now? I find myself in a world that has forgotten even the taste of life, even the very concept of life beyond existing from one day to the next. Mere continuance, where all the world is wasted away in idle play of emotions that once rang true. I am in a world where even the gods are forgotten, their bones washed away by time. A world where man has moved on, where all the legacy I have left are three sentences on Wikipedia. I thought my time had come again. I thought this could be the new me. But this is nothing. Let me stay dead this time. I'm tired. There was a long silence and then another player spoke. Red is sus, said your mom. Yeah, vote red, said XG1200. Following the game, all participating players were tracked down and treated as containment procedures dictate. What did you think about that SCP case? Please leave your comments below. The young woman was sitting on a chair in a room all alone. This is how she had spent most of her days since coming to live at the Covent. The Covent was located in a remote part of Cornwall in southern England. The only people she ever saw were the nuns who looked after her. They were good people and they had treated her well since her arrival. She had told the abbess of the Covent that she wished to repent her sins. She wanted to see a priest in order to make her confession. That morning, the nun bringing her breakfast had told her that today she was going to have a visitor. She had told her that a priest would be coming to see her in order for her to make her confession. She sat in her room waiting patiently for him to arrive. It seemed like an eternity before she eventually heard the door open. One of the nuns stood in the doorway. She turned to the priest who was standing behind her. Here she is, father, she said. The priest looked at the young woman. Suddenly, he put his hands over his eyes and started shouting. No, no, get me out of here now. The nun pulled the priest out of the room. The young woman could still hear him as he left the building. He was crying as though he was agonizing over something or someone. She was worried. What had happened to the priest? Why did he react like that when he saw her? She was thinking about what had gone wrong when she suddenly felt eyes on her. She looked at the window to her room. It was completely covered with men's faces. They seemed to be fighting with each other to get a better view of her. Each one pushing the other out of the way. It seemed like they were clamoring to get closer to her. Welcome back to SCP Exposed. Today we bring you Euclid class subject SCP-166. But before I go on, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you won't miss out on any more SCP stories. SCP-166 appears to be a female human approximately 19 years of age. She is of average height and slender build. Medical and physiological analysis indicates several deviations from baseline human norms, including accelerated hair growth approximately 20 centimeters per month. She has a vulnerability to airborne particulate matter such as cigarette smoke and aerosols, both of which can induce symptoms similar to an acute asthma attack. As even the lightest clothing tends to cause pressure ulcers or bed sores within 45 minutes of constant wear, she is allowed to go nude for medical purposes. Garments and bed linens are to be made of long staple cotton and should be changed weekly. Due to SCP-166's many health issues, medical evaluations should be carried out at least once per week. Although it seems like she doesn't need human food to survive, she is able to consume it and does willingly. 
SCP-166 is noted for her unusual effect upon human males. Upon establishing visual contact with her, 100% of human males tested attempted immediate sexual contact, regardless of their normal sexual orientation. In approximately 70% of these test subjects, the impulse faded after being removed from her presence. In 30% of these cases, however, the desire turned into obsession, resulting in violent attempts to gain access to SCP-166. Class A amnestics were efficacious in 43% of these cases. The remainder required termination. Her effect on males causes her no small amount of distress, not least due to her desire to follow a monastic life based on the principles of chastity, poverty, and obedience. For this reason, and others, contact between her and any human male is strictly prohibited. SCP-166 can be kept safely in a minimal security environment. At the moment, she is being housed in a standard Class B suite at Site-17, with the following alterations. The adjacent suite has been redesignated into a local observation post. Translucent acrylic panels have been placed in the approach corridor and staging area to prevent direct line of sight into the containment suite from the exterior hallway. Warning signs have been placed throughout the containment area indicating that no male personnel are permitted in the area. Male staff are forbidden from viewing or entering the direct vicinity of SCP-166. Violation of this order will result in immediate disciplinary review and possible termination. At least one female staff member must remain in an adjacent observation room at all times and maintain direct visual observation of SCP-166 through viewing slits or closed circuit television. In order to minimize the risk of accidental exposure, all cameras and windows shall be equipped with translucent filters with at least 50% exclusion of detail. No permanent record shall be kept of any photographic evidence of SCP-166's appearance. Reasonable requests for personal items and modifications to the containment suite may be granted upon approval by a level four or higher authority. To date, she has requested a copy of the Holy Bible, the Douay Reims Chalonaire Revision, this was granted. A Catholic rosary, which was also granted. Access to a Catholic priest for confession, mass, and other sacraments, which was denied. Various books and magazines, mostly religious in nature. This request has been granted pending a review and approval of contents. A telephone with which to contact the abbess of a covent in Cornwall, England. This has been granted. She is to be allowed one hour of telephone time a week to this phone number only. SCP-166 is generally content to remain in her quarters as long as she is provided with entertainment in the form of religious materials, books, television, and art supplies. In return for her cooperation in her own confinement, she is to be allowed a 12-hour excursion away from Site-17 to an adjacent uninhabited island no more than once per month. Limited Release Protocol 19-A is to be observed in these cases with the added restriction that no male personnel are to be allowed within 500 meters of SCP-166 during transport, and no male personnel are to be allowed on the island during her stay. The Foundation originally retrieved SCP-166 from a covent in Cornwall, England. According to the nuns, she had originally been delivered to the covent by a person of indistinguishable features who claimed that she was the offspring of an elder creature of great power and provided instructions for her care. All attempts to locate the mother have been unsuccessful to date. SCP-166 was raised by the nuns in a cloistered environment until a young man, Subject A, who sneaked into the covent to visit one of the novices, accidentally caught sight of her. Three days later, Subject A became violent and attacked the covent, attempting to gain access to SCP-166. Subject A proceeded to kill one nun and severely injure three others before being neutralized by force. A Foundation operative consulting with a local priest regarding an unrelated matter heard of the incident and proceeded to the scene. When he too became enamored, the operative immediately cut off contact, placed himself into confinement, and requested a female operative from command to take over the retrieval operation. Agent Beatrice Maddox made contact with the Mother Abbess shortly afterward, negotiating the transfer of SCP-166 to Foundation facilities for containment and research. The following is the text of a letter found in her suite, the origin of which is unknown. Dear daughter, I first met your mother when she was a girl. She had hooves for feet and starlight in her eyes. She was beautiful and natural, and I killed her with my own two hands. Eden isn't a place, it's a state of being. They wanted to take us back to it, but I stopped them. I took paradise away from us for a second time. 
I have never regretted my actions on that day, except one, that when you first met me on that day, you saw your father put a bullet into the head of your mother. I make no excuses, only explanations. I hope you understand why I did what I did. I hope you forgive me. I love you. I wish I could have done more for you. The best I could do was leave you in the hands of kind and loving people and hope they would raise you in my place. From what I've seen, they did well. I'm sorry you couldn't stay with them. I'm sorry they've brought you to this place. I promise to do my best to make sure your stay here is pleasant. I promise to keep you safe. Happy 16th birthday, honey. It was signed, your father. The foundation personnel have conducted much investigation into the whereabouts of the parents of the subject. To this date, they have been unable to determine any specific information. What do you think of that SCP case? Please leave your comments down below.